Good afternoon. Welcome to Remaking the Economy, Organizing for Black Food Sovereignty. I'm Steve Dubb, Senior Editor here at Nonprofit Quarterly, uh, coming to you from Boston on land historically stewarded uh, by the Massachusetts Nation. Uh, for this webinar, our panelists will discuss what organizing for Black food sovereignty rooted in the gifts and talents from within the Black community and anchored in a community vision looks like. Uh, for this conversation, our expert panelists are uh, Darnell Adams is a worker owner um, at the Boston-based uh, Firebrand uh, Consulting Cooperative, which supports nonprofit, for-profit, and co-op businesses, and is a member of the Food Co-op Initiative Board. Uh, Dr. Jasmine uh, Ratliff, uh, who sometimes goes by Dr. Jazz, is uh, based in New Orleans, is co-executive director of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance a coalition that builds Black leadership and institutions for food sovereignty and liberation. Uh, and we're also joined here by Malik Yakini. He's the co-founder and executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, uh, which manages the Seven Anchor D-Town Farm and is also a board member of the Detroit People's Food Co-op. Uh, a few notes. First, uh, we're very excited to get to your questions. Uh, we will start with a few questions of our own. Uh, but uh, they get to yours, so please enter your questions into the question box at the bottom of your screen, and I will share as many of them with the panelists as I can. Uh, second, uh, we will share the slides and recording after the webinar. Typically, we send that out on Monday, uh, so please don't ask, will I get the slides and recordings? Uh, you will. Uh, please also join the conversation via social media. We have the hashtag, hashtag rebuild the economy. Uh, one last thing before we get to our panel, uh, I would like to thank, gratefully acknowledge the support of uh, Prosperity Now, uh, which is sponsoring this webinar. Uh, Prosperity Now is a national DC-based nonprofit dedicated uh, to building an economy that is just fair and free from structural racism. Please learn more at prosperitynow, all one word, dot org. Uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, please complete the brief survey that will come after the webinar to inform our future work. And uh, with that, let's uh, begin. And um, I'll begin with uh, Dr. Jazz, if you could talk about yourself a little bit and the work of National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Yeah, thanks so much for that introduction, Steve. Thanks for having me. Um, so peace, everybody. As you mentioned, I'm Dr. Jazz. Um, I'm a New Orleans Ninth Ward native, um, where I recently relocated back home, but I've been spending some time in Alabama. Um, I obtained a master's degree at Auburn in community planning, and most importantly, a PhD in integrative public policy and development from the illustrious Tuskegee University. Um, my dissertation research focused there on local food systems, creating community and economic development. So right on bar with our Rebuilding the Economy talk today. And I'm excited um, also in Tuskegee where I've discovered my love for farming and my fiance, who's a fifth generation farmer. So excited to be there and also to be the new co-executive director of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance with my comrade Cicely Garrett. And the Alliance is an organization, a coalition of over 40 different Black-led organizations where we're focusing on Black food sovereignty, self-determining food economies, and land justice. And we approach these through the lens of healing, organizing, and resisting against anti-Blackness. So the Alliance is excited to have recently celebrated seven years of developing Black leadership, supporting Black communities, organizing Black self-determination, and building institutions for Black food sovereignty and liberation. So much gratitude to our founding executive director, Dara Cooper, and our co-founders, Beatrice Beckford, and one you'll hear from soon, Baba Malik Yakini, and all of our member organizations. Um, I'm just standing on the work of so many that have come before me, and I'm really excited to pick up the torch and keep the flame. Thanks. Thanks so, thanks so much. Uh, uh, Darnell, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about Firebrand? Sure. Uh, my name is Darnell Adams. I am co-owner of Firebrand Cooperative, which is a worker cooperative. We're focused mostly on uh, change management for nonprofits, for-profits, and cooperative businesses. Um, I came uh, into this space specifically from some experiences that I had 
um, in the food business kind of earlier, um, not particularly co-ops, but a shared community space, um, an industrial kitchen in Boston, which was called um, uh, was called Crop Circle Kitchen and now is called Commonwealth Kitchen. So I was a managing director there and got really interested in shared spaces and how that could actually lower the bar uh, in terms of overhead costs for people to participate in um, the food system, particularly on the producer side. From there, I um, kind of caught wind of an exciting project that was happening in the Dorchester neighborhood of Boston, um, which is mostly uh, brown and black community um, and historic historically disinvested. Um, and uh, they were trying to build a food cooperative. And that was kind of sparked my love for co-ops and kind of uh, some of the keys that I saw as actually kind of really taking um, uh, community gifts, talents, capital, and building something that was actually owned and uh, for uh, the goods and services that were needed there. So um, that put me into that space. Then from there, um, kind of branched off into consulting. So that's how I got here. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Um, and I'm glad that you all joined us. Thank you. Thanks, Darnell. Uh, Malik, uh, you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the Detroit Black uh, Food Community Security Network. I got that right. <laughs> My name is Malik Yakini, and I'm a co-founder and executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. And we do several things. We operate a seven acre farm, D-Town Farm. We have a youth program called the Food Warriors Youth Development Program. And the big thing that we're working on now is the Detroit Food Commons, a new 31,000 square foot building, the anchor of which will be the Detroit People's Food Co-op. Um, I'll say that I came to the work really as a, as a member of the Black Liberation Movement, um, which you know I feel very fortunate to be a child of the late 1960s and kind of grown into my wokeness in that time period. And so my involvement in Black Liberation preceded my involvement in food, although at times they overlap. And so I, I bring to the food work this lens of, uh, of Black sovereignty and a, a multi-decade history of working for Black sovereignty. Great, and uh, that uh, really well, I think, leads into the, the first question, which is, you know, how has how has the movement for Black food sovereignty developed over time? Um, and, you know, what are some of the movement priorities? Whoever wants to jump in first, don't be shy. I can get us started. Um, so um, like I mentioned, I'm standing on the work of so many others. So from what I've gathered, um, from what I've read, from what's been written, that the Black Food Sovereignty Movement has always been about the preservation of the Black community. Co-ops have been about survival. And currently, some leading priorities are about regaining the stewardship of the millions of acres of land that was stolen, so taking that land off the speculative market to be stewarded by Black people in perpetuity forever. Um, also a priority of capturing all that history and unwritten wisdom from our elders um, through some intergenerational exchanges while simultaneously encouraging some new and emerging farmers to pick up the torch. Um, and then thinking about the priority of just overall sovereignty. So having that power and autonomy of, over our parts and our ways that we move our food from the soil to our stomachs and developing just more post-harvest and collective distribution channels. So excited to continue to be cultivating these priorities and building that, that list with Black co-ops, especially during our up and coming day um, this year at the conference in Madison, Wisconsin, that'll be on the 19th. So looking forward. Yeah, I have kind of two different avenues in which I kind of want to explore here uh, in terms of how I look at it. One is, um, as Dr. Jazz was talking about, like since the you know, beginning of this country, certainly um, the need for and the recognition that control over systems, uh, in this case, we're talking about food systems um, for black people was necessary for liberation. Um, and so you kind of see this kind of play out in many ways when we even talk about co cooperatives and kind of who was speaking about cooperatives throughout the centuries. You have W.E.B. Du Bois, 
uh, you have Black Panthers, you have MLK, uh, MLK you have uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. So it consistently kind of comes up and up uh, again over and over because we're talking about ultimately solving for the same issues that we've been solving, uh, trying to solve for centuries. And then there's another way I look at it, which is kind of more recent history. And what I've seen since I've entered into kind of the, this movement again with the lens of, um, of cooperatives in particular. Um, and I think one thing that I've been seeing is that um, kind of this recognition also in terms of this movement um, for fruit cooperatives that was kind of very reflective of white, more affluent middle class, say um, college, um, kind of college educated folks and communities and where the focus was going for in terms of support to grow, um, to create food co-ops who would be interested in that type of food. All of what I was hearing when I first kind of showed up on the scene was, oh yeah, um, you know, this is where this model is successful. And now it is, and it was always clear for others, particularly black and brown people, but that wasn't the case. Um, but now I think in the forefront of the movement is let's talk about even in ways where you think, all right, in this, you know, food cooperatives, yeah, this is a space where everyone's liberal, where everyone kind of understands what um, the power of cooperatives that even in that particular sector, that there need to be some dismantling of some of the white supremacy um, sort of uh, notions that have kept some of the tools, some of the ideas away from um, kind of really growing in, in all the communities that it can. Thanks, Danielle. Um, Malik? Yeah, so I'll add as my two sister comrades uh, already alluded to that the movement really for black sovereignty, um, not just food sovereignty, but black sovereignty in general began the moment our sovereignty was disrupted by incursions into primarily West Africa by various Western Europeans and by the the so-called Atlantic slave trade, which disrupted our development uh, as a people. And the book, uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, uh, Walter Rodney goes into great detail about that happened, how that happened. So really ever since then, there's been efforts that I think is really important to point this out because a lot of times the narrative is that black people kind of have docilely gone along with oppression. But since the moment that oppression started, there have been black people who have resisted in every way. One of the ways that we resisted is in terms of having sovereignty over our food. So uh, even during the time our ancestors were enslaved in this country, there were efforts to make smaller gardens besides for the plantations that enslaved Africans were working on to create wealth for the white so-called slave owners. They also many times had kitchen gardens for themselves, which were an attempt to uh, recreate the types of meals that perhaps they eat in Africa, to use foods, plants that were similar to plants they remembered from Africa. So all of those were efforts really even early on to create black food sovereignty. And then uh, there's been numerous efforts over the centuries that we've been in the so-called Western hemisphere. Darnell mentioned a few of those that I think are really important. She mentioned the, the effort to develop cooperatives that Dr. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells wrote about. Uh, she mentioned the efforts of the Black Panther Party and I'll expand it just a bit and say that there were many or other organizations in the 1960s and 70s who although focused on black liberation more generally saw the importance of food and land as being an aspect of that. And then certainly I wanna reiterate as Darnell said, Fannie Lou Hamer and the Freedom Farmers. In terms of some of the priorities, adding to what Dr. Jazz said, I'll just say that one of the things many of us are concerned about is stopping the economic bleeding from black communities. And we find that in most Black communities, we have extractive economies where other ethnic groups come into our communities and control uh, various aspects of the, of the retail economy. But in particular, we see in Black communities throughout the United States that the food economy tends to be controlled by other ethnic groups. And so the profits, the revenues made on the buying of selling of food, buying and selling of food in Black communities are extracted from our communities. And so we're trying to stop that bleeding, stop that extraction and build, as Dr. Jazz said, self-determining food economies, economies which are circular and which create wealth and empowerment for the people who live in those communities. 
Thanks, Malik. And I, I think there was an audience question about defining Black food sovereignty. I feel like you you did that, so I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, next question, I wanted to ask about what you see are key elements of a healthy food system. I can kick us off again. Um, just on that extraction tip, I think healthy yeah. is not extractive. I think it's regenerative. Um, I think we need to have healthy land. And that does not mean mass producing. That means producing more locally. That means taking care of the way that the ways that we do it and taking care of our people while we're doing it. So that healthy food system is inclusive of the land, our people, and our practices. So and being in control of that for sure. Thanks. Yeah, I would say kind of, you know, I, I, I focus on kind of one area in the food system and it's so broad. Um, you know, we're looking at um, land, as Dr. Jazz has mentioned, we're looking at um, production, um, how food is moved, who actually owns seeds, um, you know, retail, uh, you name it, it's kind of across the board, there's ways in which all of these systems kind of work together in a, in a, in a macro way to create what is frankly, not only on a healthy uh, food system for, for black and brown people, but certainly uh, for, for everyone, really. Um, so, you know, if you kind of follow who's kind of benefiting from the system the way that it is, um, it's certainly not communities that we're kind of involved in. That's really clear um, down from the merchant level all the way up to kind of, again, who, you know, the kind of the large industry scale type um, farming situations, right? So that being said, I think that there is ways in which, again, if someone is working in one sector and is very aware that it's actually connected to another, that there's all these kind of coalitions and ways that people are building um, uh, that are looking at the food system kind of more holistically, um, are looking at uh, building a healthy food system, not separate of um, black food sovereign, uh, black sovereignty, generally speaking, and black liberation uh, as well. So it's not it's not separate of. Um, and so the ways that people are starting to integrate those ideas um, are, you know, I think a really hope, <laughs> a dream, and I think actually seeing movement in doing things differently. Right, business as usual is not actually uh, benefiting. Uh, benefiting us, um, generally speaking, as a country. Yes, 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 to everything, uh, again, both of my colleagues said, um, and especially, I, I like the last part Darnell was talking about, about the, the way that this food work is linked to the larger work. And I'll say that the, the causes of food insecurity and the causes of not having food sovereignty are the same causes that we have uh, police brutality and police murder, the same reasons that we have poor education in black and brown communities, the same reasons that we see disparities in wealth. And so these things are not separate from the general struggle for justice and equality. And as has been pointed out by many people, we need an intersectional uh, approach to solving these problems because they all have the same root, root causes. So I would say in terms of what are some of the key elements of a healthy food system, one would be fair and just policy, uh, policy that promotes and incentivizes the production and distribution of uh, nutrient dense food and promotes that uh, by small scale farming, not by industrial farming. Uh, and also easy access to those foods by people regardless of their so-called race, income or zip code and policy that halts the uh, predatory and extractive practices of corporations and wealthy individuals. Secondly, a healthy food system would have a farming philosophy that practices um, philosophy and practice that honors the earth and is both sustainable and regenerative. Again, as Dr. Jazz said, uh, practices that honor, respect, protect, and fairly pay workers within the food system at all levels. Uh, cooperatively own ownership of grocery stores is, I think, a very important element of a fair and just food system. And finally, a food system uh, 
that is fair and just would honor the cultural traditions of Africans, indigenous people, and others whose cultural knowledge has been suppressed by the system of white supremacy. Thanks. Um, so I want to follow up and uh, I mean, Darnell and Malik, I know you guys are both directly involved in food co-ops and uh, Dr. Jazz, I assume through the Alliance here supporting those, uh, you know, how can food co-ops be not just about providing healthy food for communities, but actually advancing uh, racial and economic justice? Well, to be honest, I think in my um, experience, kind of both as organizer, but also in conversation with other Black organizers, that um, actually it's really clear what um, folks are working on is not just opening a grocery store. I have not yet spoken to someone who was a Black organizer who said, what we really need to do is just is open a grocery store and it stopped there. And as a matter of fact, sometimes it's the second or third thing that they mention. Right? So it's like, okay, by root of this store, yes, we are going to get healthy food into the community. Yes, we're going to get dignified jobs into the community and all of those things, all very important. And really clear, and it's just one piece and one tool to kind of addressing larger systematic issues, right? So the idea that there is a lack of healthy food in a community is not something that just kind of happened. Um, it's clearly in by all data and by all historical record, um, just, you know, made a system, you know, it's a systematic issue that was made by people, right? Po by policies, by, by all of those type of things. We didn't just happen into these situations. So if you kind of would, were to take a very narrow view and say, okay, well, what we need to do is just bring in food, doesn't actually address at all the fact that there's longstanding policies, um, that you're looking at things that, uh, you know, people kind of keep saying that happened in the, in the past, but still are affecting people right now in terms of redlining. Um, you look at, you know, health disparities, you look at really even lack of food and you just draw those redlined areas and it's the same exact spots, All right? So folks know, <laughs> like this is not healthy food. Yes, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, food, um, some of the funding that's coming into some of these projects, people really want to focus on like, yes, let's get food here. There's a food desert, right? Not the language that I use, but it's USDA designation. Um, and that's fine. Um, I want to support the the cause <laughs> because of uh, your take is, you know, of course, food, that's fantastic. But there's all sorts of other ways and the reason why people are moving in this space that isn't just specifically food, at least in my estimation. You, you know, I wish, I wish you had some panelists that I didn't agree with 100%. I know we, <laughs> could have, we could have a little friction on this panel, but there's nothing either panelists have said that I disagree with one iota. I'll just maybe add a little more to what I heard um, Darnell say, um, that one of the advantages of a co-op is it really organizes the members of a community. And just, the, just having community members organized is important in and of itself. In fact, uh, one of the, the teachers and leaders in the uh, Black Liberation Movement has been Kwame Ture, formerly known as Stoke, Stokely Carmichael. And one of the things he often said is organize, 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 that we can't expect the people who are disorganized to be able to push back against a system of highly entrenched policies and practices. And so just the fact that a co-op brings community members together uh, in a democratic fashion is extremely important. In a place like Detroit, it's even more important where over the last uh, 15 years ago, we've had emergency management imposed on the city of Detroit by the governor, both in terms of the, the municipal government, uh, an emergency manager was appointed who, whose power superseded those of all the elected officials in Detroit. This was in 2012 or so. 
and uh, we've had emergency management imposed on the school board also so that the elected school board officials had no voice and that one appointed person had more power than all the elected officials. So in the face of that, it's really important that people begin to take back our agency and organizing and co-ops is a way uh, to do that. Also, food co-ops help to decentralize power and wealth, which in American society, because uh, economics and white supremacy uh, intersect and cross paths so much and are kind of interdependent upon each other, most of the people in whose hands wealth and power is concentrated are already wealthy white men. And so co-ops begin to develop collective power uh, and collective decision-making and a way to push back against the centralization of power in the hands of wealthy white men. And, and they provide healthy, fresh, nutrient-dense food. Yes. Can, Malik, could I get you to say a little bit about Detroit Food uh, Commons, the project there, and how that developed? Uh, sure, I'll try to keep it brief because it's a 12-year yeah. long story. <laughs> uh, I'll yeah. say that in 2010, we started working on developing a food co-op I won't go into all of the dirty details that have happened since 2010, but I'll say that uh, we are finally a month or so away from beginning construction on this new 31,000 square foot building. And, you know, we knew we wanted a food co-op and we tried to, well, we knew we wanted a food co-op and then after visiting other food co-ops, particularly the Kalamazoo People's Food Co-op, we expanded our vision and also wanted shared use kitchens a community meeting space and office space. And so this project morphed from just a food co-op to a larger facility that can contain all of those functions. And so we looked for an existing building in the North End community of Detroit, which is the neighborhood we decided we wanted to develop the co-op and there were no existing buildings uh, on the main street. Let me say that we wanted to make sure we were on the main street of Detroit, Woodward Avenue. There were no existing buildings that could accommodate all those functions. And so we realized we would have to build a building, which made this project uh, incredibly complex. It's complex enough just to start a food co-op, but then to build a building and start a food co-op simultaneously has been an incredibly complex project. But again, we're about a month or so away from beginning construction. We expect to open the doors in late June or early July of 2023. Great, thanks. Dr. Jazz, I think you wanted to get in there. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm just amazed. I can't wait to visit Detroit. What up, though? And just be in the building like, yes. Um, it gives me all the good feels every, every time I hear you inching closer um, to that, you know, just opening up. So excited to just continue to agree with everyone on the panel when we were talking about the ways that co-ops can just build more than just co-ops because who just needs a grocery store? If that worked, we'd already be fed, right? So the collective power that happens and specifically the political power, I'm really um, just feeling like that's what's the difference about co-ops and it's straight from the community and it does deconcentrate the wealth and the power um, from the hands of the few and allows us to practice cooperative governance. So I'm um, excited to be doing that in real life. As you mentioned, Steve, I am supporting co-ops and the development of that um, in partnership with the Collective Courage Fund. And that is named specifically after Dr. Gordon, Jessica Gordon Nimhart's um, Collective Courage Fund um, book. So I've been like keeping it you know, no, next to me. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. Look at that, that's, that's what we do. So um, yeah, this is, all aligned, so excited to continue this work. Yeah, I highly recommend it. And uh, I'll try to, one of us will try to get a link into the chat, I think. Um, that was not planned, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, Can I add another comment to that? Yeah, and say please. that our organization, part of my interest in food co-ops also is that we're an anti-capitalist organization. I wanna make sure I get this in. That we think capitalism is a totally bankrupt system figuratively and perhaps liter literally also, uh, that does not serve humanity well and does not serve the planet well. And so for us, cooperatives are a step to begin to break the mental strangle yeah. that capitalism has on us and to move us towards a more equitable economy. So we really have this, this larger view, which is also rooted in dismantling capitalism. Great, thanks, Moe. Um, you know, a question, this may be for you, Dr. Jess, um, but I'm, you know, how do you see the, these Black-led food co-ops linking to the 
black farming and black ownership of land. I mean, this is all part of the movement for black food sovereignty, right? Yeah, it's an intentional connection. I don't think it can be one without the other. It's all the more co-ops we need, we have the more farmers we need, the more land we need. And the other way around, the more land we have, the more ability we can have more farmers and the more markets those farmers need and to be able to feed their community. So I feel that it's all in tandem, which is why that's our priority for black co-ops to get more land and to have more farmers. And I'm excited to continue to see that increase in the excitement around it. Um, people are getting more hip. I mean, it's been, been sexy and been hot, but now it's like, oh, people are really tuning in. So it's definitely all aligned. Great. Um, another question for, for the group, you know, uh, what do you see as the role of, of education in, in uh, Black food justice and sovereignty work? You know, what, what needs to be taught and what needs to be unlearned? And I, Dr. Jazz, I know you've done some research in this area, so you can talk about that. Malik, I know you've done a lot of, we all are educators, right? So however you want to respond. Yeah, I can just quickly say I feel it's people, everyone needs to know that it's not new, like it's just not a new concept and it's just things that we've always been doing and the up and coming generations also need to be taught that this new individual capitalist mindset, that's new, that's the new part and we won't necessarily get too far. Um, Wait, the way co-ops are able to satisfy economic and social needs and exchange goods and services without an extractive manner um, need to be learned, the, the ways to cooperate. Great. Um, well, I think I'll start going to some of the audience questions. There's uh, quite a few good ones here. Um, what is, you know, this is, this is a broad question, but I'll let you guys try to jump into it. What do you think about the role of culture in addressing these issues? Um, uh, how do we normalize cooperative uh, enterprises and healthy eating and living? Uh, I'll, I'll jump into that uh, first. Um, I think it's really interesting. I, it was, made me think about the question about education. Um, and I, I mean, I'm a little bit cautious around kind of like what do people need to know and what I need to teach them, right? Because <laughs> I don't think how to go about it that way. People know plenty. Um, but one thing that I would say is, you know, again, this was unplanned, but I've been kind of diving into collective courage for kind of various reasons and writing some articles around it. But, um, but there's this kind of incredible outline of like this cooperative movement, this cooperative ways in which we are interacting, doing business for the Black community has been happening since forever. And because we have not kind of historically been able to tell our own stories, it's been missed, right? Like it's not, this is totally nothing new, nothing that we're doing all of a sudden, nothing that we're making up, nothing. So it's like those kind of those rich histories, those, the fact that your, your, your mother, your grandmother, your great grandfather, whatever it might be actually might have been uh, involved in some kind of co-op or credit union or a mutual fund or whatever it might be. Um, you know, maybe, you know, we're part of a SUSU or something like that. Like, the, the, the history kind of have been has been obscured. Um, there's kind of lots of reasons for that that Dr. Uh, Jessica Nemhart kind of cut kind of outlines. Um, but it's nonetheless, it's sort of in some ways of remembering, right? <laughs> like we know these things. Um, and then also to be able to say like, this is part of our culture. It's actually, although it's been told that it's not, you know, like black people don't do co-ops that's for, you know, hippies or something like that. It's just absolutely not true. The, the history of it bears out that all along we've been doing this work, all along we're gonna continue to do this work for our liberation. Um, um, go ahead, so, yeah. So, you know, in addition to, again, yes to everything my two sisters said, and I'll, I'll just add that there's this process of decolonizing our minds that not just people involved in food co-ops have to engage in, but really people who are seeking justice in general. So in addition to the, the ravages of capitalism on our mind, also white supremacy, this idea that the ideas and the culture and the worldview that emanate from Western Europe 
uh, the universal standard by which everybody else should look at the world needs to be challenged as well. And so really the economic system of capitalism in many ways grows out of that cultural experience. And so what many of us have done in addition to you know, fighting the kind of concrete conditions we face has been to, to look at what did pre-colonial Africa and what did pre-colonial indigenous societies look like in terms of their economic systems and how they view their relationship to each other and trying to see how we can uh, gain knowledge and insight from, from the, the traditional understanding and the traditional wisdom. And that's not to say in some romantic way that we're going to go back to you know, 14th century Mali and try to recreate that. But certainly that there are some values and lessons that are embedded in indigenous cultures, which are suppressed by the system of white supremacy, which can help us to function in a more cooperative way. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I got this question, this is a fairly simple question, but I, I figure it's, I, I've seen it from a number of folks. So uh, what is the preferred or use language instead of uh, food desert? I, I think I know how I'd answer it, but I'm curious as to what, what term you prefer. Yeah, I think that was directed towards you, Darnell. They were... Oh, was it? Oh, yeah, but food apartheid. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think there's words are not precise, right? To describe the history and the policies that actually created what it is, right? So I can kind of say, you know, the man-made, person-made food disaster. <laughs> um, it doesn't kind of quite roll off the tongue. Um, some people say food apartheid. I, I would say I'm probably closer to that language. Um, I haven't found something that really captures, maybe food apartheid is the closest um, to kind of describing the kind of systematic um, way in which uh, the conditions occurred to create these uh, situations and also why it's so durable, right? Because it doesn't now take a kind of a racist actor to have the system create the, you know, stay the way it is, right? It, it, you know, there's not some person who has to think like, ooh, how do we make sure that folks don't access, you know, healthy food? Like it's beyond that because it's codified because it's all the systems are kind of run on that original kind of way in which things were kind of programmed. So it's the best that I have, um, but I'm, I'm definitely open if somebody has other language that, um, I'm happy to adopt it, <laughs> but that's the best I've get, gotten to. Yeah, I'm very much aligned with Darnell and I, I agree with you 100% that language is imprecise. And so we try to use language that as best as possible describes what we're trying to describe. And I, I've stopped using the term food deserts as well. And I think food apartheid is a good term to describe the situation that black people and brown people find ourselves in, in terms of lack of access to food. I'm not sure food apartheid would be the best term to describe uh, rural folks in Montana who have lack of access to food. So I think food apartheid is a great term to describe the intentionality in creating disparities in black and brown communities. I'm not sure that in a more general sense, it describes everyone's condition who has lack of access to food. Great, thanks. Um, so this question, uh also seems to have a lot of supporters and it's, you know, how, um, how does the movement for black sovereignty connect with uh, movements for indigenous uh, food sovereignty? And Malik, I know you were saying a little bit about this earlier. And on this and, and, and I'll say as Dr. Jass has heard me say, typically I try not to go first because it's part of my own uh, okay. struggle. <laughs> Um, but I, I'll, I'll go first this time and say that, you know, we have to first recognize that America is really a settler colonial state. And it was established on the land that had been stewarded, as was said at the beginning of this webinar, by uh, various groups of indigenous people. And so essentially, America is on stolen land, if you could say that, although I don't believe in the concept of land ownership at all. But uh, gangster land might be a better term to, to describe it. Um, and so we have to start with that understanding. And so any solution that we build 
uh, towards justice and black food sovereignty has to embrace and acknowledge the right for sovereignty and food sovereignty by the indigenous people as well. And I'm one who thinks we should be uh, working consciously to link those struggles as much as possible. It's so beautifully said. I actually don't know if I have anything else to kind of add to that. I think um, this conversation is happening um, specifically also in the in the food co-op world, um, knowing that there is some uh, some systems that are the same and some histories that are different. But what are the ways in which kind of addressing all of those things? Right. It's um, to me, you know, kind of justice for for black people and not thinking about like, justice for others doesn't, does, that doesn't make sense, right? That, that's just not a thing. Um, so uh, kind of all the ways and kind of different ways, you know, even with the Food Co-op Initiative kind of talking about, okay, we have systems, uh, kind of ways in which we were supporting um, uh, cooperatives. That first kind of that model that was, you know, this kind of white college town type of thing. Okay, now we're looking, um, and happily kind of looking about, all right, in what ways can we support um, black communities? But then, you know, how are we looking at, you know, immigrant communities, you know, indigenous communities who are folks that they should partner with because maybe they don't have the uh, capacity to kind of deal with individual struggles. Um, yes, maybe some of the overarching things, but certainly the, you know, uh, you know, kind of in thinking about what's happening, say in Detroit, yes, looks very different than what might be happening in like rural, you know, Montana, Minnesota, South Dakota, et cetera, so. Great. Uh, Dr. Jessica, do you wanna jump in here? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm feeling like that. I don't feel like I have much to add besides I don't think it's a, a separate movement. I do think yeah. it's, um, you know, not versus black versus brown. I think it's and we're all when black people when we all win. It's like anti blackness that is the root of white supremacy. So once that's done, you know. Um, so yeah, I've, I'm really excited and to continue with my comrades um, in the indigenous communities to build together. Great. Um, so this question. Um, so the one of the largest, um, so you can think of this as the organization that's named or broader, but one of the largest uh, anti-hunger nonprofits in the United States is called Feeding America. Um, and have you seen any movement, <laughs> you know, whether it's them or within the anti-hunger movement more broadly um, to addressing uh, systemic issues in, in, the, in the food system or, you know, is, is that, are, is it still sort of a treating the symptoms type thing or are they actually shifting? I'm not familiar, um, Malik, Dr. Jess. Who's the they? Uh, well, Feeding America was the one that's specifically named, but I think there's, I think there's sort of, you know, there's all these, you know, food hunger organizations, oh. you know, yeah, you know, which should be allies in theory in the, you know, the food sovereignty and aren't necessarily, right? Yeah. Oh boy. I like, <laughs> what am I, what's gonna come out of my mouth? Um okay, well, I guess one thing I would say is that um, you know, people have a right to be fed, have a right not to be hungry have a human right to have nutrition, period. And I'm all for looking at kind of these emergency situations, which people need to access food. Absolutely. I, I guess, I mean, I'm kind of like treading a little bit, but I'll just say the thing, which is like, but I'd also like these organizations to put themselves out of business. So, when are we going to fix this thing, right? And so you kind of follow some of the ways in which kind of money is kind of going into those systems with those organizations, or, you know, groups might be able to dump a bunch of food. Sometimes they're not nutritious at all for a big write-off and those type of things. And I'm like, I, I mean, 
I, again, all about emergency, um, kind of making sure that people are, are fed. Um, and I would, yeah, aiming to put those groups out of business and hope they are trying to put themselves out of business too, right? Thanks. I think there is some shift taking place in emergency food um, over the last several years. And I think many people are seeing that the charity model is not the way forward and that we can't solve the problem of, of hunger by simply you know, giving food to people because that's not the, the reason that we have hunger. Um, so there's been quite a bit written in recent years and uh, including the book by my friend whose name is escaping me right now, forgive me, who is the head of the Community Food Security Coalition, um, who's written about kind of the, the industry that's developed around hunger. But I think there is a shift taking place. It's a slow shift. And for me, it's not enough. You know, people are not really realizing the, the, the connection between the nature of capitalism and hunger. And so they still seem to be very incremental steps to me. Got it, thanks. Um, so let's see, another question. Um, what are the panelists, what are your thoughts about the role of uh, political education in organizing and in the movement uh, toward food sovereignty? In particular, what can, specific, what, can, what can individual food co-ops do to contribute to the movement? I think um, by when Leek answered that um, earlier when he was mentioning about the collectiveness um, of it, just getting people organized. So once co-ops are started, um, I think that's the part of the movement where we're getting people organized. And if there's a specific policy or something that's prohibiting the success or moving forward and the development of that co-op, then that garnered success can happen from that organization of the people. I think the nature of the, the the you kind of the co-op movement is interesting kind of being in a co-op or organizing for a co-op um, because you kind of get under the hood a little bit of um, kind of a democratic organization right um, that we talk about education there's some things like that you would not necessarily you know if as part of another organization kind of start to understand or be able to participate in um, and it, some of it is minutia, uh, it might seem like minutia, but it's actually really important. Um, the process of bylaws and, and how those actually work and how, um, you know, what is your recourse if the, you know, the board or the organization is not actually doing what you wish it to do. You're actually an owner of that business. Um, I think there is all sorts of ways and even trying to get a co-op started in the way that people are coming together that brings you into rooms I certainly with me brought me into rooms that I never expected to be, you know, all of a sudden now I'm walking around city hall. Well, I get to <laughs> figure out how city hall works real quickly. Um, you know, or maybe, you know, so, so there's all sorts of ways in which you start participating, not only in perhaps the polit you know, politics, um, in your community, but also the kind of democratic nature of this organization and that part and parcel is kind of being able to uh, participate. There is um, co-op principles, internationally recognized co-op principles um, that kind of speak to all these different pieces, right? So that it's not uh, someone who is uh, a owner or a member or is organizing that only um, is privy to only one little part of kind of, hey, what's on the shelf of the store, but actually is really, invested and participating uh, in the, the actual business, right? So there's all sorts of ways in which I think, you know, democracy is alive and well and <laughs> participating in, in this kind of structure. So, so I would say in response to the question, um, we have to really define what politics is. And typically when people say politics or political education, they're thinking about the electoral aspect of politics. Um, I, I go by, I, I, I have adopted the definition of politics. The politics is the art and science of gaining, maintaining, and using power. And so when we talk about political education from that perspective, it's much broader than just who is elected to office, who uh, can enact the policy. 
but it's really all of the activities that are designed to build power for the oppressed and to disempower the oppressive. And so, yes, absolutely, political education is necessary in a broad sense so that we don't get caught up in thinking that uh, voting for Heckel or Jekyll in the bourgeois electoral political process is going to fundamentally change our reality. It may ease the suffering of people to some degree, but uh, you know, the, the Biden administration, like the administrations before, uh, fundamentally supports U.S. imperialism and fundamentally supports uh, capitalism and the domination by European culture. And so it's not just a question of who we elect within that system, but it's a question of how we chart out our liberation and our journey to build power in a more broad and comprehensive way. Great. Um, so a question that kind of, I think, in some ways builds on, on the, the last discussion, you know, there's a request to uh, clarify the work of dismantling systems and kind of what does that mean at the local level? And, you know, can, are there successes or lessons learned that any of you would like to share in that respect? Maybe that was directed at me since I've used that term a couple of times. So I'll, I'll jump <laughs> in and say that, let me be clear that I'm not under the illusion that dismantling capitalism is an easy venture and it's not something that's going to happen in the next 10, 15 years. And so particularly in this time period where um, the more revolutionary voices that we heard in the 60s and 70s have largely been either silenced or uh, muted. Um, and so at this point, dismantling those systems starts, I think, with breaking the mental monopoly that those systems have on our minds, uh, that people have to begin to see that these systems do not work in their best interest. And then slowly, step by step, by doing things like creating cooperatives, we begin to lessen the stranglehold that these systems have on us. And so I would say that at this point in time, that's the primary way, you know, consciousness raising is the primary way that we work to, towards dismantling the stranglehold these systems have on us. But certainly uh, the protest in the streets that we've seen over the last several years uh, dismantle certain aspects, the most, some of the most vehement aspects of the oppressive systems because they cause people to really examine those systems and the way in which injustice is embedded in them. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll put a period there. Thanks. Yeah, I think if I were to wake up in the morning and think like, how am I gonna dismantle <laughs> impressive systems today? I wouldn't get up. Um, so uh, that's the aim. Um, but I think for me, you know, it's like, I think you start where you are. Um, for me, my particular passion, my particular interest is in leadership development. Um, there are so many folks who have brilliant ideas that are moving uh, in ways in their community that they haven't, uh, that, that, that will move the needle over time. Um, I, my particular passion is working with those folks in terms of thinking about how to support what happens when you as a black leader kind of get into this world and you're trying to push against these kind of really quite sticky, durable kind of situations. Um, and so that's kind of the tack that I've taken, kind of take that little bite. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, you know, that that's what I, that's what I want to do. That's what I continue to do. Um, it's exciting to me. And then to the other extent, also with organizational development, um, where I'm working with, some of these, you know, white organizations who say, hey, well, I want to do something different. You know, like there's some consciousness raising there on that end too, which is like, okay, let's, we really want to do this. Let's take a look at things in a very different way than you have before. Great. Um, let's see, I think I'll try one more audience question and then we'll have to wrap up question. Um, this is kind of interesting. There's a question about the food as medicine movement and how does it intersect with the movement for, for Black food sovereignty? Yeah, um, I, I like to think of food as medicine. Um, if we had the right food, um, we wouldn't be not, um, we and being the Black community would not be the number one um, people dying from 
preventable diseases. So I think it's directly related. Um, and the way that we can continue to look at food as medicine and as a human right gets more to the sovereign part. Um, well, let me let me close with this question. You know, and there, there's also folks from the audience who are sort of asking something similar, like what steps uh, can people take, you know, nonprofits, philanthropy, so forth, the folks who are on this call uh, to support the movement for Black food justice and food sovereignty? Well, I know of an organization <laughs> that I would really love uh, Dr. Jazz actually to kind of, Dr. Jazz and Malik to speak about their organizations. Um, I, I'll, I'll kind of finish at the end, but I think the work that you're doing is really relevant to the, that question. So I'd love you to take the lead on that. Yeah, I, I'll say support life cycle funding. Um, it's so hard to move this work as you both just mentioned, like, oh, we're just going to dismantle capitalism tomorrow. Like, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some development. And that's going to take some shifting some funds. And that's long-term funding, life cycle grants, those self-determining grants. So not grants that are extractive and I feel like are poverty pimping or predatory to make a specific funding organization agenda move forward instead of fund the organization that you're funding. So meeting with those people, grantees, and just learning about their work and the best ways to support, I feel like, um, are the things to do. So just one-on-one -on -one relationships, it's all about building relationships and seeing the best ways to support. Thank you. I'll add to what's been said that, well, first of all, I'll, I'll address this in two different ways. For Black folks, we need Black folks to be involved in organizations that are building Black food sovereignty on every level. For other folks who are not Black folks, who, but who want to support Black food sovereignty, there's several important things that can be done. As Dr. Jazz said, you know, the financial support is extremely important, but also within the structures you're currently working within, and Darnell alluded to this also, that you make a, a, a very conscious and intense effort to help people undo the racism in their own heads. And so that's one of the very uh, most important things that I think white allies can do to organize other white people to begin to understand how they've internalized concepts related to the system of white supremacy. Within the Detroit People's Food Co-op, we have an anti-racist uh, study group. Some of the white members of the Detroit People's Food Co-op have organized themselves to study texts such as Petty Mac McIntosh's the invisible back uh, knapsack so that they have a better understanding of how they've been conditioned and they're more able to function in a situation where they have to follow black leadership. Yeah, and I would say, um, yes, absolutely. Um, so if the question is coming, particularly from funders out there, um, please look, uh, I think there was some links that's happening here too in the chat, but also, um, there's plenty of ways to plug in, as uh, Dr. Jazz and uh, Malik have mentioned. Um, it's kind of lined up. This kind of feels like I'm a little bit like, well, anyway, I'm, I wrote an article, um, I wrote, and that will be coming out in MPQ at some point in time coming up. Um, and I actually do speak a bit about how um, funders can kind of look at the way they might direct some of their funds um, to particularly for food co-ops. Um, there's just lots of ways. And I think there's some education kind of in terms of what is this field? What is this even looking about? What are we talking about? And what is the nature of the kind of funding um, that people are putting together to actually do these projects, right? Um, there's some learning there. Um, so I tried to provide that. And, uh, and then also, again, that kind of relationship building, right? So there's kind of interest here. You have Dr. Chess, you have me, you have Malik um, and others um, to, to reach out if you want to learn more, um, because there's some really exciting things here um, that we're doing that will dovetail if you are actually looking to kind of move the needle in terms of this um, uh, Black sovereignty, if you're looking at Black liberation, if you're looking at any number of things might dovetail to your, your mission and vision for your organization. Uh, so thank you for that question and your interest. All right. Well, uh, we got to as many audience questions as we could. Um, there's still many we 
couldn't get to, but uh, thank you for all your excellent questions. Thanks to uh, to the uh, to our uh, panelists, uh, Darnell Adams uh, from Firebrand uh, Consulting Cooperative in Boston, uh, Malik Akini from the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, um, Dr. Jazz uh, Ratliff from uh, National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Um, and uh, we'll be back in a month uh, in terms of the Remaking the Economy series uh, on March 10th on uh, Redefining Risk. And, uh, you know, keep the conversation going both at, uh, on social media and beyond. And uh, you have everyone's contact information there on the slides and the slides will be made available as well. So thanks again to uh, Darnell, uh, Malik and Dr. Jazz and to all of you for participating. Thanks for having me.